We are empowered by lay-driven leadership, connecting lay ministries and business people to share Christ in the marketplace in support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to a special hymn sing song service this evening. We're going to be singing for the next few minutes, actually the next 30 minutes, and so we want to welcome you to this little special hymn sing. We're going to start with one of my favorites, which is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. So join with us as we sing, please. Heavenly Music. Jesus. 
next song will be I'm But a Stranger Here. Our next song is going to be, Oh, When Shall I See Jesus? so glad that you are joining us. For those of you who are just coming in, I would invite you to join us in singing. I see lots of you enjoying us singing up here, but I want to hear you joining in with us because this is what a hymn sing is, is when we all sing together. Our next song in the list is going to be How Far From Home, and I hope that it is not too far. Amen? Amen. All right, join us in singing How Far From Home. Speed. 
next song will be I Saw One Weary. Our next song will be in the sweet by and by. Sigh for the blessing of 
Amen. Our next song is going to be uh, Shall We Gather at the River. Hymn number 432, Shall We Gather at the River? I say we say yes. This evening will be Blessed Assurance. Yeah. 
next song will be Because He Lives. Our next song is going to be Lift, Hi Lift Up the Trumpet. Sorry, it's Oh Brother Be Faithful. Oh Brother Be Faithful, soon Jesus will come.
to ASI Orlando, Florida. And my name is Angela Lomakang. And my name is John Lomakang. It has been an exciting week, hasn't it, honey? Absolutely. I just love ASI. I'm always so blessed being here. Yes, we have seen wonderful testimonies. We've seen the wonderful booths. We have met people from all over the world. Yes. Oh, and I love uh, it. we have also been touched by the sermons, the testimonies. Yes. We have seen lives being transformed through oh. these various ministries. Yes. And for those of you that don't know what ASI is, yes. it is sharing Jesus in the marketplace. <laughs> That's right. And so you may have a business, or you may be a dentist, right. or a doctor, or a teacher, right. or someone who just wants to share Jesus yes. other than a pastor or clergy, this is what ASI is all about. So you could also inquire about how to become a member. But this whole week, if you're in the Orlando area, we encourage you to come down because there's still so much more to cover. Tonight, what there's going to be tomorrow? some good music. What about tonight? Who's speaking tonight? Yes, tonight, uh, <laughs> Dr. John Shin yes, is going to be Loma speaking Linda. tonight from Loma Linda University. Yes. And I know his testimony is going to be great because he's going to be talking about how he has been sharing Jesus in the marketplace. What about tomorrow? Tomorrow, oh, it's going to be a, a, a spiritually Wonderful. filled day. Uh, the main speaker is going to be D. Casper. D. Casper in the morning, and Pastor Mark Finley is going to be capping off tomorrow night. And you know Pastor Mark Finley yes. is a wonderful, wonderful speaker. But I tell you, ASI has been transforming lives for many, many years, from here in America yes, and to all the, the way around the world. And so if you are not far away, come and join us. There's a lot of room. Mm -hmm. Sabbath morning, I believe, is going to be packed here. What oh, do you think? Oh, people from all over will be here. But if you can't be here, be sure to tune in. You're certainly going to be blessed. And I tell you what, I think what we should do right now is uh, join those who are singing this wonderful song, oh, my Jesus is, is coming, coming again. again. Once again, thank you for being here. And if you're not, join us here at ASI. God bless you. God bless you. Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. And going and talks, proclaiming, he claims, Jesus is coming again. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. I just want to welcome you all to um, ASI's Friday evening program. We welcome you all. And if this is your first time joining, I'm so glad you can join us as the Sabbath starts. Amen. Why don't we open the program tonight with a word of prayer? Would you please bow your heads with me? Our gracious, kind Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have these amazing hymns that remind us of our goal, which is heaven, and can boost our spirits and just point us towards the ultimate goal. Father, please let the programming tonight lift our souls closer to heaven, and may we soon see you face to face. Thank you so much for all you've done, and thank you that we can be here this evening. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Good evening, ASI. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and what a blessing it is to be at ASI and be able to say, Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. You know, what a week it has been, tremendous week. And we hope that you have been 
truly blessed by attending seminars and evening programs and, and visiting with friends and getting reacquainted and being able to make new friends. And, and as you have been enjoying those special moments, um, our true and division leaders have been quite busy. In fact, we have missed out in seminars and evening programs because we have been with our children. But you know what, though? I will have to say that that's been the best blessing for us here at ASI to be able to be with our children. You know, for those who are parents and or grandparents here at ASI, you know that it's a true blessing to know that when you take your child and drop them off in their room, that they're going to receive Christ-centered programming that will be safe and fun. Amen? What a blessing and what a satisfaction to know that our children are going to be receiving content that will lead them into a closer relationship with Jesus. You know, I'm reminded of a quote by Ellen G. White when she wrote, those who love God should feel deeply interested in the children and youth. To them, God has revealed his truth and salvation. And here at ASI, our True and division leaders understand that the time is now. The time is now. The time is now for our children to choose to follow Jesus. Amen? The time is now for our children to learn to be witnesses for Jesus. Amen? The time is now for our children to make decisions to be his disciples. And here at ASI, our children are challenged, they're charged to let their light shine, to set their minds on things above, to be witnesses, illuminated, and on fire for God. Amen? And today, this evening, we want to showcase just snapshots of some of the exciting things that we have been doing this week. Among them is learning a theme song entitled, By Our Love, By Our Love. We're going to sing that to you in just a moment. And it's been a joy to be able to see children just completely engaged and really enjoying their time together. So after we sing a song, we're going to hear just brief reports from each division sharing with you the exciting things we've been learning and doing this entire week. You'll, be, you'll notice that each division is wearing their class t-shirt. Oh, they've been so anxious and excited to showcase their t-shirts and, you know, but it's more about t it's more than just t-shirts. They've been learning to embrace and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and be able to have a friendship with him. And so at this time, our kids are all prepared. All right, look at all those smiling faces. We are so excited to be able to share this time with you. You know, one of my personal joys is that not only am I a division leader, but I'm also a parent. And so I, I'm truly satisfied to see my son and my daughter come to ASI because I know, I know that they're going to be challenged. I know that they're, they're going to be, they're going to be inspired. And the reason I come to ASI is because I know that my son and daughter will be coming back home with a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, friends, enjoy the song that we're going to sing together this evening. May it be a tremendous blessing for you by our love. And I know that you're going to enjoy it very, very much. Karin Sanchez has been our fearless leader this whole week. And she's going to direct our song. So, wow, what a choir. Are you ready, church? We're going to be blessed. What a choir. Let's listen as we share with you a very special song.
Wasn't that wonderful? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And at this time, at this time, we're going to go ahead and hear brief reports from each division to tell us the exciting things that have been happening this week. And we'll begin with the kindergarten division. Good evening. My name is Jenny Arce. I'm the kindergarten teacher for this year at ASI. And the kindergarten class's sub-theme this year was Let Your Light Shine. God's light shines on each one of us, and it's up to us to determine how we're going to respond to that light. Are we going to absorb it? Are we going to take it in and keep it for ourselves? Or are we going to let it pass through and continue on our way? Or are we going to embrace it and then shine it back to others so that they can receive the blessing of his beautiful light? From flashlights and mirrors, from the sun shining and the moon reflecting, the stars twinkling and the planets glowing, and fireflies synchronizing their lights to communicate with each other, the kindergarten class is learning all about light and nature that God has created. They sing about light, they do crafts about light, and they use lots of glow-in-the-dark paint. They get to travel through tunnels lit up with black lights to experience bioluminescence. That was a new word they learned this week, a big word, and it means living light that God has created to help them learn better how they can reflect the light that God is shining on them. Thank you so much for bringing your children to our kindergarten class. So the primary class, our theme was Set your minds above, as our song said. We wanted to set our minds above. We know that heaven's calling, and the major thing that heaven is all about is about redemption of human beings. And we want to be able to aid the Lord in that target. But first of all, we have one of our primary that wants to share what we have learned in our class. So we're going to give the microphone to him, and he will share some of the things that we have learned in class. But one of the most passionate things that they have loved is this song. So we learned in our primary class a, a Bible verse, and it, it's found in Matthew 5, 16, and it says... In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father that is in heaven. Amen. And we also learned from missionaries coming to our class and telling about their experience. And we had a guest, guest speaker. His name was um, Cowboy Willie. And we... We learned how to be like, be like willing horses and not like, like wild horses, to be like willing horses and listen to Jesus' words. And we also went to an Audi, and we learned how to take care of plants and animals. The primary class had a very fun time. Amen. Thank you, primaries. Well, the next division is the juniors division, ages 10 to 12. And the juniors this year, we've had the theme witness. So you can see in our t-shirts, witness. And we've been talking about the different ways that one can witness. And we've really enjoyed discovering that witnessing is it's not, it's not necessarily a, a spiritual gift that only a few people have. Uh, to witness is the joy and the privilege of every believer in Christ. And this week we've been learning not only to witness or about witnessing, but also witnessing in action. And, and I'd like to invite Shayla. Shayla's been one of our juniors. And, and Shayla, let me, let me tell our friends that this week, we, one of the things we did was make these cards, these encouraging cards. And they, oh, you should have seen them. We cut 
cardstock and glued different colors and stickers, and we wrote Bible promises, and we created these cards, and then we challenged the juniors to go out into the convention area and to randomly approach individuals and surround them, Operation Ring of Fire it was called, and pray and share a Bible promise. And Shayla, tell us about your experience. Well, one of the um, people we surrounded was near the, the entrance, near the valley um, registration counter. Yeah. And the lady there, we went and, and gave her a card and prayed with her. And she said, this is really what I needed. And I knew she really, really meant much to her. And that's I hope what we do in life is that much to everybody else. And I hope that's it. Amen. Thank you, Shayla. And you know what? Not only did we talk about the baptism of fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit, but we also talked about the baptism by water. And I'd like to invite Juan Carlos to come and join me. And Juan Carlos is one of the juniors. And, and, I, and I will never forget how Juan Carlos was among the many juniors who responded to various appeals that we would make at different times throughout our program. One of the appeals was to choose to follow Jesus, to choose to live for him and be a witness. And Juan Carlos, I want to share with our friends here, what's a decision that you made, a very special one, that you made just yesterday. Tell us about it. The decision that I made yesterday was to be baptized. Amen. 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 And and one of the things, one of the things that is really exciting, and this this is a first for the division, uh, juniors division, at least the first in a while, is that when is this baptism going to take place? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. In fact, we have reserved the swimming pool here at Rose and Shingle Creek. And at 345, 345, you're all invited to come to a baptismal celebration as Juan Carlos has completed two Bible study sets. He has his morning devotional. He comes to church faithfully, and he's made a decision to be baptized here at ASI. And tomorrow, we're going to celebrate with heaven. Amen? So God bless you as we continue with Witnessing for him. All right, juniors, juniors, roll call. Three, two, one. Witness! All right. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. God has been doing big things, amen. My name is Christian De Los Santos. I'm representing the early team department here at ASI, and our theme has been illuminate. And we have been focusing on how God not only wants us to share the light, but to be the light. At times we can share things or just share his truth, but it's one thing to share something you haven't experienced. It's one thing to share something that you think is good, but that you haven't actually tried. But it's a whole other thing to experience God's goodness, to experience how he's transformed your life, and then to share it with conviction. And so that's what we've been uh, discussing in the early teen uh, class, how we can have that personal experience with God as well as we've been focusing on mental health. There's a crisis, you could say, on mental health in our world. Would you agree? And it's something that God wants us to have, a healthy mind. So I have here with me Joshua and Abriel. So Abriel, what was your experience in the early teen class? Well, in the mental health class, um, we learned how to manage and recognize our emotions. We learned how to process thoughts how to be positive and grateful in all circumstances in life. We learned that mental health is very important. And, um, and we learned a lot, and we had a great time. Amen. Amen. And Joshua, what was your experience in the early teen class? Well, some things that I enjoyed about the early teens program was that, well, one, we got a reminder of how we need to be focused on God and do all the things we do around what he has done for us and about him. And also learning about how to maintain and grow our EQ has been helpful. And all the games and the people has also amped up the experience of the ASI Early Teens program. Amen. Well, we've had a blast with these kids. And as the Lord is coming soon, which I believe, amen. And as the world is in tremendous need of light as it's getting darker, I pray that each one of us can illuminate the light of God, and to all those around us. Amen? May God bless you. Good evening and happy Sabbath. 
My name is Jonathan Nino. I have the privilege of working as a pastor in the Southern New England Conference, but I have had the great privilege to be able to work as a youth leader here for our youth class here in ASI. And it's been a wonderful experience that we have had, that we have shared. And our theme for this year has been, can you say it with me? On fire. And we believe that not only being on fire is important, but also to maintain that fire. And that's what we have been doing and talking about, finding different ways how we can maintain that fire and be able to share that fire with others. Some of the things that we have been doing is that we have been in contact with the Lord and Savior through our united prayer and focus on prayer and the study of the word. We have also gone to a local food bank that we were able to witness there and to provide services there. And as well, but the most, the greatest thing that I have had is to work with all of you guys because you guys are like super awesome awesome. Amen. So, uh, and I also have some friends here with us that would like to share of their experience with the youth group. Happy Sabbath, everyone. So my name is Hope Griffin. I'm 17 years old. I think I can speak for everybody in my class and I say we loved it. And so yesterday, as Jonathan mentioned, we went on outreach to a local food bank and my group um, bagged sweet potatoes. It was actually pretty fun, actually. Although I don't think I'll be wanting any sweet potatoes anytime soon. <laughs> so um, then yesterday, we also had um, Pastor Don McLafferty come to our class and he trained us kind of how to um, make friends with people um, and then introduce them to what Jesus has done in our lives. So I thought that was really cool. And um, uh, as Pastor Jonathan mentioned, um, united prayer. I think that was my favorite part. It was just super cool hearing each other share our hearts with God and be real in prayer. And um, we also would sing um, during those sessions. And I know the angels were singing with us. So to sum it all up, God has been doing awesome stuff in the youth class. And I know he has more to do. I didn't bet. Sorry. <clears throat> I did not bag the sweet potatoes. <laughs> Had to clear my throat. Um, I think the absolute highlight out of all of this, because I think it was just so amazing, the absolute highlight out of the drama of just like running with your teammates and doing a relay race or bagging sweet potatoes and just having so much fun and making friends, it was just getting down on your knees just letting the stress roll off you and praying. That was just so amazing. And that feeling of just like knowing that you're all united as one, it's just, you cannot get it anywhere else. So let's keep our youth in prayer because they're not our future, they're our present, they're our now. God bless you all. We're here to give you the report that of what God has done through the Youth for Jesus project this year. We went to two churches that we had been to previously and had a good experience, Umatilla and Plymouth Sorrento. We sent out brochures and we got 85 people that signed up at Umatilla and 55 that signed up at Plymouth Sorrento. Youth for Jesus has three results. Every year I've been involved, it's had three results. One is the uh, changing of the lives of the students. The second one is revival in the churches where we've gone. And the third one is the uh, souls that we were able to influence to come into the church. And of course, it's all the work of the Holy Spirit. So I have uh, Amaya here with me. She was one of the speakers. And uh, Amaya, how did you feel about being asked to preach? Good evening, ASI. Um, when I was asked to preach, I was very scared because this is something that is out of my comfort zone. And I had went to Youth for Jesus last year and got out of my comfort zone, but speaking and preaching was different for me because I was speaking about real topics to real people, so I felt like I wasn't capable of preaching. So being asked to preach was very scary for me. Did preaching uh, improve your spiritual life? 
it most definitely did. It taught me a lot of prayer, the power of prayer and perseverance, praying when I needed him and depending on him and perseverance, pushing through when I'm tired, practicing the sermons. So yes, it taught me a lot. Now the Lord sent us an amazing trainer this year by the name of Dr. Merle Tull. And uh, how did his training help you? Uh, Dr. Tull's um, training really helped me. I loved his constructive criticism and his patience with us. His training really helped me. He helped me realize that I am a good speaker and he trained me. So Dr. Tall, I wanna thank you for everything training me because um, his training really showed me that I can be a better speaker and I did become a better speaker. So thank you. Actually, uh, the Lord worked through him to achieve something that's never happened in the five years that I've been leading this. Every single student was willing to speak up front. And so we had to come up with a, a method to use them all. So we used uh, three in each church to preach the messages and three to give the health talks. And I listened to all of them. They were all really good. Okay, Elena, uh, what did you do at the Adventist Nursing Home? Hello, ASI. Well, at the nursing home in Advent Health, we went around and we were actually part of this program called Christmas in July, um, one of the first times we went there. And we had a wonderful experience. Even the, um, the people who were working there loved it. And we went around each room and we sang Christmas carols, you know, something that every, every person knows and will be touched by. And it was a wonderful experience. Great. And how... Did the residents react to what you were doing? Man, they accepted it greatly. I actually had saw multiple people cry and it made me just like my heart wrenched for these people because a lot of these people that we are going to are in these nursing homes almost for life. It's really sad, but they had somebody to talk to then, somebody to minister to them, and that really made an impact in their life. And we know the leader was really surprised. She says, where do you get these young people? Do you have any outreach uh, or did you enjoy preaching? Preaching, preaching was a very interesting experience for me. Um, I had preached before, but not to the scale of where I was. Um, and it definitely taught me to get out of my shell more and you know, grow, I guess. <laughs> uh, you listened to several of Elena's sermons. The Lord's given her a special gift. When she speaks, her heart is involved. You can tell that the, uh, there's feeling there. And I know the audiences really were blessed by her speaking. Do you have any outreach experience you'd like to share? Absolutely. Um, there was one specific time where I was outreaching with who you just saw, Amaya. And I was at this door and I knock on the door and nobody answers. And I'm like, okay, well, nobody's gonna answer. I'll put a pamphlet. And then I got this little small voice, Elena, you should put a great controversy. And I was like, God, you really want me to put a great controversy at the door? Like nobody's here, why should I put it there? Like we're only supposed to do that if they come to the door. And, you know, I'm going back and forth with God, like, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. And Amaya is next to me, and she goes, should we leave a great controversy? And I'm like, God works in crazy ways. So we put the great controversy there, and I never stopped talking to him for the rest of that day. Very good. Our next speaker is C. C, uh, how did you find the spiritual atmosphere at Youth for Jesus? Hello, SI. Okay, so Youth for Jesus, the atmosphere, the spiritual atmosphere there was like so amazing. And I'm saying that partly as someone who lives in San Diego, California, we don't get a lot of that. Um, and so I remember going and I was a little bit nervous, a little hesitant because I've had some pretty 
poor experiences with very conservative areas, a lot of judgment, a lot of um, stuff. But the people there, especially the adults, they were so loving and caring and godly. And like, it tore down all of those walls for me. Like, it was such a rewarding experience. It really helped me grow, I think, spiritually. Amen. Uh, how did the preaching affect you? As someone who always, I think, kind of prided myself in being a pretty good reader or a pretty good writer, preaching was a really humbling experience for me because when you're preaching up there, you're not talking at people. You have to talk with people, um, and you can't do it. Like, God has to really work through you, and I was really leaning on God a lot up there because I am not good at empathizing and being friendly and all of that. Like, God really had to work with me up there because I was tired, and I was like, God, it has to be you. <laughs> <laughs> However, I listened to her sermons, and uh, they were very good. So we're thankful you were willing to speak. Praise God. Did you make an important decision while you were with us? Um, yes. I, along with my brother and my classmate, decided to get baptized at the end of um, <laughs> at the end of the <laughs> sessions. Um, I had put it off for a long time, mostly because I was kind of afraid um, that doing it would be like changing my whole life in one day. And um, I just kind of realized, like, it's just a public declaration of me saying I want to live the way that I'm already trying to live. Um, and so I was still up there, I was still nervous, and like I was getting closer and closer, and finally I was sitting there in my baptismal gown, like Loki having a panic attack on the pew, like what am I doing? Um, and I was like, God, please just give me a sign I'm doing the right thing here. And so my brother, who also got baptized, he was sitting next to me and he grabbed my hand. And that was it for me because like three months ago, he chopped off all his hair. It used to be longer than mine. And that was the last time he squeezed my hand really hard. And after that, he was like, I'm never holding your hand again. 14-year-old boys. Um, and so he grabbed my hand, and I was like, okay, God, thank you. And that, that's really what got me in the water, I think. <laughs> Amen. You know, uh, the Lord works in interesting ways. And uh, I think it was on Friday... Uh, Dr. Tull came to me and he said, we need to make an appeal. You see, a lot of these people don't come on Sabbath morning. And so he said, we need to make an appeal Sabbath morning. So he went to Umatilla and he made an appeal and I made one at Plymouth Sorrento. And that's where the decisions came in for the young people to be baptized. Plus some other people also stood and in Plymouth Sorrento, there were two that uh, manifested a desire for baptism. So that was uh, one of those God things. Thank you, C. Thank you. Chris? Chris was an experienced evangelist, so we recognized immediately he was a good speaker, but he did get improved uh, with the training. So give us an experience from the community outreach. So we got to go to this one lady's place, Brenda, and we were able to help her save $1,700 by moving a golf cart that was stuck in her backyard into the garage. We also helped her trim up her place, do some landscaping, and it was just a real blessing. What? Who was going to charge her the $1,700? Oh, the homeowners association in her neighborhood. You know, and these people, we helped several of them, they were... Their back was against the wall, so they were just so happy for these young people to come by and help them. Uh, tell us about a couple that you met after the meeting on the Sabbath. So it was July 23rd. I just finished preaching the meeting, the sermon about the Sabbath, and we're already outside the church, and we're getting ready to leave when there's this couple, Bernard and Alejandra, who come up and ask for the pastor of the church because they had heard about the prophecy seminar and everything, and so I, they were directed to me because I was the speaker for the evening. And so I, I, got connected, I got them connected with the YouTube channel that we were streaming the meetings so that they could listen. And they asked many questions about Daniel's prophecies and also about the Sabbath. And they also attended a few more meetings. So we're still praying that the seed that was planted will bear the fruit. Now I see you have a young man by the name of John here. <laughs> Tell us about him. Okay. 
So Mr. John received a flyer in the mail, just like that. And he came to our meetings at Umatilla. He attended every single night. And then towards the end, he made this very important decision. And I'll let him tell about it. OK. Well, I received a flyer just like this in my mailbox. And uh, I don't believe it was by accident. And <laughs> uh, I had been, uh, well, to make a long story short, I was uh, baptized a Methodist and uh, grew up uh, mostly attending Baptist uh, Sunday school and church, but never was affiliated uh, a member of uh, any church. And uh, boy, when I got this flyer uh, about a week and a half, I looked at it and looked at it about every day and said, well, I'm going over there. So I drove over there and uh, it was uh, so uh, riveting that I, uh, I couldn't miss it. And I was back every night and uh, I had a, uh, the all, I can't say enough about the, uh, you know, the, the Youth for Jesus because they did a, a marvelous job of, uh, of presenting the, the Bible facts and the truth. And I could not dispute anything uh, because it was all backed up by Scripture. Yeah. Yes. And I, and so, <laughs> amen. Whoa. <laughs> so, so uh, I made the decision. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Toll, uh, right after a, a very good uh, a delivery from uh, C. Avita, uh, who just spoke previously, um, he got up and, uh, and uh, said a few words through God that, uh, and something inside me said, uh, John the procrastinator, uh, get up and move forward. And, uh, <laughs> and so I become John the doer and, uh, and I went forward and, uh, and never missed, uh, like I say, never missed a, uh, a presentation. Matter of fact, I used to get there 30, at least 15, but mostly 30 minutes early, so... And then uh, Christopher here, he uh, he done a, uh, a wonderful uh, a sermon, and uh, you know, and, and uh, the the thing that got me was come out of Babylon, and uh, I said, you know, that's where I've been, and I want to come out of Babylon. So, Amen. so the uh, so the rest the rest is history. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So, thank you. And amen, and praise the Lord. You know, uh, we were a little reluctant to baptize John because we didn't finish all the series of meetings, and there were a couple other subjects he needed to hear. But he was so urgent to be baptized that Pastor Putt went to his home, went over those subjects with him, and he got baptized. Now we have Anthony. Uh, you've seen him before. This is his third year with Youth for Jesus. And Anthony, why do you keep coming to Youth for Jesus? How many of you like good peer pressure? <laughs> How many of you like trials? How many of you like uh, having to do something on a daily basis that you can't do by yourself? That's why I, I keep coming to YFJ. It pressures me to be a better person. It pressures me to have a good connection with Jesus because I have to. When there are souls on the line, you have to be connected. And it's a very good atmosphere. That's why I keep coming. I should mention this from last year because you weren't all here probably. Uh, in Orange City, we had a series of meetings and uh, they knew ahead of time that it was going to be the youth speaking. But <laughs> One of the key people was used to Mark Finley speaking. And so she came to me and said, can't we get the evangelist to come and speak in this church? I said, no, it's too late. He's already started in another church. He can't come here. And so Anthony and Isabel were the speakers. And at the end, the church was excited about the youth preaching that. And so uh, Anthony's grown a lot since he's been with us. And this time, he got used to be part of the training team. So uh, how did you enjoy teaching a class to the other students? Well, sometimes when you're a teenager teaching other teenagers, they don't really like to listen or be quiet. 
<laughs> but we eventually got them to settle down and we had some good classes. And a lot of times, young people listen better to young people in certain things. So it's a good experience and always good to practice teaching because teaching and preaching are different things. So yes, I was a very good experience. Amen. I was blessed. And what would you say to other teenagers that might be wondering about coming to Youth for Jesus? Come to Youth for Jesus. What are you waiting for? Okay, I've been here three years. Every year is better than the previous year. Now, a lot of that is mindset, but you also get to train yourself with mindset when you're here at YFJ because you don't necessarily like everything and sometimes you have some problems with the people at YFJ, but you're stuck with them. So it's a very, very good character building and I think it's, I would recommend it. I think every ASI young person should go to YFJ. <laughs> Our next speaker is Pastor Putt. He is one of the greatest ministers to work with. His whole heart is in it, and he helps us in every possible way he can. And I'd like him to share some of the uh, community work and, and other type of work that we did. Well, first of all, it was an awesome honor for us to have Youth for Jesus a second time. You know, they say lightning doesn't strike twice, but it did in our case. Uh, 2000, we had Youth for Jesus at our church, and uh, last two years ago, we had one of our newly baptized share here, and she was uh, very, very excited. And we are so thankful this year we had John uh, here to share his experience. But we had a tremendous team. Uh, we had some very, very good Bible workers. Uh, that was really, really awesome. We had Maboshe at, at Plymouth Rental Church. We had Don and Cody, that, and Maboshe worked in both locations. And uh, as a result, they have, we have 80 Bible studies that we have started in the little town of Umatilla, a small little, almost like a little village. And uh, so we're excited about the church following up. It's really been, what it does, what Youth for Jesus does is it gives a, a real inspiration to the church family to get involved in evangelism. And it, the church is never the same after Youth for Jesus has come. Uh, we are also very excited about a couple of people that have postponed their baptism. One was sick and another was uh, uh, was a young lad that wanted to have more family members there. So we're going to be having that in a couple of weeks. But we had outreach uh, in the community. Donna uh, visited and uh, met some really amazing people. One was a doctor, um, Mary, uh, Dr. Mary. She was an assistant pastor at one of the local churches in Umatilla. And uh, the young people uh, planted some beautiful begonias for her. She was excited. And also uh, one of the boys uh, worked on her computer and got the computer talking to the printer, which was really exciting for her. Another gentleman was a 90-year-old man whose uh, yard had not needed a lot of attention. Young people went in, they just uh, went in there, picked up all the garbage, cleaned up everything, and he was ecstatic. And then after every visit, the young people have prayer with those that we visited. So that, that community element, that community work element, which is really, really good. Another one was Millie, Willie May, and that was a lady that... Um, 65 years old, uh, she, uh, Donna would go and ask them to get started on Bible studies, but she'd also look for needs in that, uh, in the community. And she saw that uh, there was a lot of, this lady had, um, had a, a car injury, uh, car, and uh, as a result, she was, uh, had to leave work. She had to early retire, and she was, you know, financially not as well off as she would have liked to have been. And so uh, a lot of things needed repair around the house. She had, her husband had passed away. She was a widow. And so as a result of that, uh, the young people came in and just transformed the whole, the whole uh, yard, picked up everything, cleaned up everything, trimmed trees. And then we noticed that the paint was peeling off the walls. And uh, so the kids uh, start scraping, and the more you scrape, the more paint would peel off. So we re reached the point to the realizing that if we keep pe peeling, there'll be no paint left. So let's stop now. But so what, the, what one of our church members is a professional painter, and he volunteered to paint the house. And so Youth for Jesus provided the paint, uh, the young people provided the labor, and, and he came in with a spray machine and, and did a beautiful job. And this woman 
literally cried as she saw her house and her life being transformed. Not only the physical building, she said it was also spiritually very, very uplifting for her. So Willie Mae was amazing, and, she, and she's, uh, we'll continue to be friends. We're continuing to do Bible studies with all these folks. And uh, also, uh, we have a couple of other people that we uh, work with, uh, another a lady by the name of Lurie, uh, elderly lady, 84 years old, um, was a, uh, had been a uh, ice capade figure skater in her earlier years, and after her injury, uh, wasn't able to skate anymore, and she went into opera singing. And she studied in, in Europe, in Austria and Germany, and also did some in the United States. An awesome lady. So they went in and did weeding and, and watering and, and beautification, planting flowers at her place, and she loved that. Another person was uh, that we, all the young people went in and took care of was uh, Wilma, who was a nurse that was disabled from a car accident. And uh, they took care of trimming weeds and beautifying and, and praying. Every place the young people went, they prayed with the people that they served. And uh, so these are friends, uh, these are long-term friendships that we're going to have. Uh, and we're going to continue to follow up and, and nurture and love and invite them all to ultimately uh, come with us to heaven when Jesus comes. Amen. Some of them have said they want to come to church now because of what the young people did for them. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, one other interesting thing is that in our church, uh, the baptism, the other three people that were baptized, uh, one had been a two, in, in 2000, uh, no, sorry, 2020, he is 90 years old, and he made a decision to join the church through profession of faith because he was baptized as a Church of God uh, individual. But this year, he came to all the meetings. He drove his, himself, 92 years old, and he was convicted that he needed to be rebaptized. And so he was rebaptized this year. Amen. Well, we're about out of time. Uh, we had a privilege of going to Reluca McRoberts' home and discovered that what we did last year was continuing to bring uh, people into the church. And also their prayer meeting is stocked by most of the people that come from what we did last year. And this year we did have in Plymouth Sorrento two baptisms. We also had... Uh, uh, six baptisms over in uh, Umatilla. Three of them were the young people, but the other three were uh, local people. But as we look at what was accomplished, we can see that they're going to continue to get more baptisms as the year goes by. And of course, it was uplinked as well. And I was told in Plymouth Sorrento they had 1,500 views. That's not 1,500 for one lecture, but all the lectures together, 1,500 views. And the same thing is true over in, uh, in Umatilla. I counted it up myself on YouTube. And what they're telling me is that it keeps climbing from two years ago. Praise the Lord. Amen.
Good evening and happy Sabbath ASI. You'll notice that I'm approaching the podium alone. I don't have an interview for you, an offering in action interview you for this evening, but I want to call your attention to uh, the offering for tomorrow. Do you have your program booklets with you per chance? And you may not, they may be on your phone, but I just want to bring your attention to page 26 and 27 where the 29 projects are listed. And we have three projects that will share equally in, in the overflow that we know God will bless us with tomorrow, amen? So I just wanted to share a little bit with you. Since ASI has begun this weekend, we've heard reports from ministries and organizations how God has blessed their efforts to meet felt needs and share the gospel through our ASI offerings. Some of these organizations and ministries shared a report on how offerings that we have given have been used, and many of them have shared what they aspire to do as a result of the offerings that we will receive this weekend. We've heard about creative ways that have been developed for outreach like the 3ABN Dare to Dream hard drive with spiritual and practical programming that will be shared in prisons. We've heard about Lifestyle TV's app that offers health and spiritual content to reach secular European countries and beyond. We've heard about the upgrading of our lifestyle facilities like Weimar, Wildwood, Yuji Pines to support their mission to change lives and to train missionaries to be witnesses in their workplace and their sphere of influence. We know about efforts by ministries like ASAP to reach the displaced and often forgotten or providing much needed dental services like those provided in Zambia by the Partnership of International Caring Hands and Riverside Farm and giving people skills to provide their families for their families as Farm Stew is doing in the Sudan. And building one-day churches in Madagascar to be the home for new believers and a light of hope in their community. These are just a few of what we wanted to share with you to give you an idea of the scope of the projects that will be supported by the offering on tomorrow. I'm praying that with all that we have heard, and that our hearts have been stirred, that we are not only inspired and motivated to be revived for, to witness, but that we can unite with those on the front lines who seek to transform the lives of others as they are sent by the Lord to reach, teach, preach, and share the love of Jesus. I once heard a statement that I thought was very interesting and I think is a call to all of us who have been blessed by God with so much. And it says something like this, if you have many blessings, build a longer table, not a taller fence. I invite you to pray with me tonight to ask God what we can do to build a longer table so that as many as possible still in the world who don't know about Jesus can join us at the welcome table in heaven. Can you do that for me? Let us pray and ask God, what is it that we can do so that we can hasten your soon coming? Because until everyone knows and has an opportunity to accept Jesus, he will not come. And I don't want that resting on my responsibility. I want to be responsible for ensuring that people know that Jesus is coming, that he loves them, and we can all go home. So let us build a longer table and not a taller fence. Thank you. Good evening and happy Sabbath. It is my privilege to be able to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Dr. Calvin Kim. So Dr. Kim is a dentist who practices in Olympia, Washington, but he would tell you that that's his side job. His main job is winning souls for Christ, and he happens to do it as a dentist. Um, Calvin is passionate about spreading the gospel through any means possible. Um, he was the co-founder of uh, Army Bible Camp and other ministries such as F5 Challenge. 
And through his various efforts and projects, he's touched the lives of thousands of people. But what I appreciate most about Calvin is that he has an, in, an infectious love for Christ. You cannot spend time with Dr. Calvin Kim without becoming excited about sharing the gospel. And if you give him five minutes to tell you stories, he will bombard you with stories of divine appointments he's had with people in airports, at gas stations, and how the Lord has led to a spiritual conversation. And so I've been personally blessed by Calvin's ministry, and I am looking forward to what he has to share with us tonight. So I just pray that the Lord will put his words in Calvin's mouth, and I just want to thank him for sharing with us for tonight. So please welcome our speaker, Dr. Calvin Kim. up from the valley of fear you can see down off in the distance and you're about to lose heart right here but don't ever give in don't ever give up god is with you and you'll overcome will tell you that you can't make Good evening, GYC. Oh. <laughs> Earlier I thought, I hope I don't say that, and I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> Good evening, ASI and former GYCers. <laughs> it was just four months ago today, the first Friday of April. I was in Auburn, California at the Quarry. It's a popular place to go rock climbing. I was there with Mark Payton. Some of you may know who Mark Payton, and he, Payton is. He is an Adventist filmmaker, and he's actually here in the audience today. We're looking forward to going there and rock climbing together. When I first arrived, as I walked into the quarry, there was a lady who greeted me, and I returned the greeting with a hello, and I thought, what a nice, kind lady. Mark and I had a wonderful time climbing together. We had climbed for about an hour and a half. I was hanging from the ropes, from the rocks, adjacent, if they could put up the, the pictures from the PowerPoint. I was hanging up from the rocks adjacent to this wall. I was resting, and we heard a climber scream. Instinctively, we turned and we looked. We saw a climber falling. We expected the rope to catch her. She fell 70 feet, 
and slammed right into the ground. Mark let me down as fast as he could. He took off to the lady. I took off to call 911. After I called 911, I came over to the lady who was lying there. She was unconscious but breathing. It was the lady who had greeted me when I had first arrived. As we were waiting for the medics, all I could do right there was hold her hand and pray for her. As her life is hanging in the balances, there was only one question looming on my mind. Does this woman know Jesus? Did somebody tell her about Jesus? And that God would preserve her life if she doesn't know Jesus. They tried to land a helicopter. They could not. They had to abort. It seemed like forever as we're waiting. Soon a climber up came onto the scene who was a firefighter, and he began to assess the situation. And as soon as her pulse stopped and she stopped breathing, previously our priority was not to move her because we wanted to protect her spine. Our priorities had changed. Our priority was not to protect her spine anymore. Now our priority was to save her life. We moved her about 10 feet to a flat area where we could put her on her back. We cut our harness off, and we began doing chest compressions on her. I've been a dentist for 22 years. I take CPR refresher courses every other year. I've never done CPR on somebody. And at this moment, we're taking turns doing CPR on her. Her phone rang. I picked up the phone. It was her oldest son calling. He was frantic. I had to tell him that his mother was in an accident, that we were doing CPR, and the medics were on their way. Pretty soon, the medics arrived. They began to shock her. They put an IV line into her. They gave her epinephrine. Pretty soon, we loaded her onto a spinal board, put her onto a utility vehicle, and she was on the way to the hospital. In route to the hospital, the message came through that they pronounced her dead. I thought I was fine that evening, but that night I had trouble sleeping. I've never seen anyone die before. It was the most traumatic thing I've ever seen before. Crystal Reber, 44-year-old mother of two boys. One, one moment, it was a beautiful day at the quarry. The next minute, her day had come to an end. Two weeks later, I was at her funeral. A humbling reminder that life is fragile. Life is fleeting, and life is so unpredictable. Just last summer, there was a plane crash in Angwin, California, and this hits close to home for me, not because it occurred where I went to college at PUC, but because I knew one of the passengers on the plane. Shauna Waite was on this plane with her husband and her father. Shauna was 37 years old. Her husband was 37. All three of them died. Three years ago, Shauna and I were on a running team together. Shauna was an amazing person. She loved animals. She was a veterinarian. She had a heart of service, and she loved people. My heart is heavy for Shauna's mother, who in just one moment lost her daughter, her husband, and her son-in-law. My heart is heavy for their one-year-old boy, baby Kieran, who in just one moment lost his mother and father. While not being able to comprehend what has happened at his age, I just imagine that their little boy must sense that something is missing in his life, that two people who gave him so much love are no longer there. Shauna and I had connected because she had messaged me about joining me on a mission trip that my friends and I were organizing. She was not able to go, and she messaged me, I know I couldn't make this one, but would love to come on another one. At the young age of 37, her aspirations and opportunities were cut short. In scripture, we find metaphors and intermittent reminders about the brevity of life. David laments that life is like a shadow. A shadow is ephemeral. A shadow is transient, fleeting. In the book of Psalms, Moses encourages us to ask God to teach us to number our days. Why are we encouraged to number our days? Because there is a clarity of vision that comes from contemplating about the brevity of life. It is as we think about the shortness of time in life that we may be compelled to examine our lives, to take inventory, to prioritize. And I ask myself, if I was on that plane with my wife and my father, what would my final moments look like? And it wasn't difficult at all to imagine what I would say and what I would do. I'd say, honey, I love you so much. I love you, honey. I'd say, dad, I love you, dad. And I'd say to my wife, we need to call the kids right now. And if we could get a hold of our kids, 
I say, Karis and Kaya, you need to listen to mommy and daddy very carefully because our plane is not going to make it. We want to tell you how much we love you. We want to tell you how proud we are of you, how blessed we are to be your parents. We want to ask that you would forgive us for any time we were anything less than the best parents that we could be for you guys. Karis, you need to take care of your baby sister, Kaya. Karis and Kaya, you promised mommy and daddy that you will be faithful to Jesus. And one day soon, we will see you again. We love you so much. We want to pray with you right now. And I will submit that for every single person in here, under the same circumstances, your conversation will be either similar or almost identical. Why? Because it's intuitive, it's instinctive, it's innate. It doesn't have to be scripted. You and I, we already know what's most important in life. Because what matters most will not be your bank account. It won't be your stock portfolio, your real estate, your cryptocurrency, how many followers you have on social media. What matters most, will my loved ones be in heaven? What have I done to increase or decrease the population of heaven? What have I done for others that God has put into my life? What have I done for Jesus? As the missionary C.T. Studd put it best, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. The title of this message, One Life to Give, One Life to Live, One Life to Give, if you bow your heads with me for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you bestowed upon us. We want to ask you that you would teach us to number our days. Help us to live wisely. I pray that you would anoint my lips, that I would just be a conduit for your Holy Spirit to speak through. In your name I pray. Amen. If you could meet one person in the world, who would it be and why? There was one person I've always wanted to meet. It's my favorite sports hero. His name is Dick Hoyt. When I mention his name, you may not know who he is, but when I tell you his story, you may recognize his story. Dick and his wife, Judy, had a son named Rick. He was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. He was, neck. He was deprived of oxygen. He came out spastic quadriplegic with cerebral palsy. He could not talk. He could not walk. The doctor said he would be a vegetable and that they should just discard him and put him into an institution. But Rick was blessed. His parents wanted to take him home and raise him with the rest of their boys. Could you imagine being trapped in a human prison? Cognitively, you can understand, you can hear, you know what's going on, but you can't express yourself. At the age of 10, Tufts University created a communicating device. He could communicate by tapping his head on a pad, one letter at a time. His first words, his father thought he would say, hi, dad. His mother thought he would say, hi, mom. He typed out G-O-B-R-U-I-N-S. Go Bruins, because they were hockey fans. <laughs> when Rick was 15 years old, he wanted to participate in a five-mile benefit race for a lacrosse player at a school who had become paralyzed. Rick asked his dad if they could run the race. There was one problem. Dick was 36 years old, and Dick was not a runner. Great fathers, however, make sacrifices. Great fathers give up their time, money, and physical energy for the sake of giving their children a better life, or sometimes merely a smile. His son's request was all the motivation he needed. He agreed and pushed his son's wheelchair the full five miles. They came in second to last, and when they were done, he was so exhausted. It was so hard for Dick, he had blood coming out of his urine for two weeks, and he was wiped out. When they got home, Rick typed out a message to his dad on the computer that would change the course of their life forever. Dad, when I'm running, it feels like my disability disappears. Imagine how a father would feel when his disabled son tells him, that when he is running, it feels like his disability disappears. At that moment, Dick discovered his mission in life, that even if it was just for 10 minutes, for half an hour, for one hour, he would do whatever it takes to make his son not to feel disabled. And while he was at school, he put a bag of cement in his wheelchair, and he started to run. Look at this picture. Dick is wiped out, and look at the smile on Rick's face. Over the next three and a half decades, the pair set achieved and surpassed not only their own goals, but everyone's expectations of a father carrying, toying, and pushing his wheelchair-bound adult son. Over 1,100 races, marathons, triathlons, duathlons, Boston Marathon 32 times, six full Ironmans, they even ran and biked across the United States. For anyone who doesn't know about running, for most marathoners, their goal is to run under four hours. If you're a serious marathoner, you want to run under three hours. The fastest marathoners are coming in right over two hours. 
while pushing his son at the Marine Corps Marathon. His fastest marathon time was two hours and 40 minutes. I had a running coach. She ran a two hour and 44 minute marathon, qualified her for the Olympic trials. They have never broken any records for time, speed, or distance, but they've broken every record for devotion, perseverance, courage, inspiration, and showing hope to others. Rick was once asked, if you could give his father one thing, what would it be? He said, the thing I'd most like is for my dad to sit in the chair and I would push him for once. Because Rick loved his daddy. Three years ago, I got to meet Dick in Boston. I told him I was his biggest fan. I think he believed me because he stepped aside and he started chatting with me. And then he asked me for my contact information. And when I got home, a few weeks later, he had mailed me books and DVDs and even a gift for my daughter. But it gets better than this. Every once in a while on my Facebook posts, he would actually put a comment. I could say that Dick and I were friends. I'm so glad that I got to meet Dick because he just passed away last year at the age of 80. Through Dick and Rick's story, I've gotten a beautiful glimpse of God's love for me, pushing me, pulling me, and carrying me through the vicissitudes of life. What motivated Dick to do this? It's a four-letter word. L-O-V-E. It's the greatest motivator there ever was. For God so loved the world that he gave. You love, you give. The famous French general Napoleon Bonaparte once said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Love is the greatest motivator there ever was. Dick had a mission in life, and it was fueled and motivated by love. You and I, we already know what our mission in life is. It's to share the light of saving truth with a world in darkness. And if we love Jesus with all our heart... Fulfilling our mission should be a joy. It will not be a duty. It will be a privilege and an honor. Trayson is a 25-year-old patient of mine. He was a basketball star in high school. When you're a basketball star in high school, life is pretty grand. After high school, during practice, he broke his ankle, and during a routine surgery, they accidentally severed his sciatic nerve while giving him a nerve block. He became disabled in his left leg, suffered from CRPS, which is ranked as the most painful form of chronic pain, unlikely to run or play basketball ever again. You got dreams? Trey had dreams too. And his dreams had been shattered into a million pieces. Trey told me, I can't even walk my dog. Trey was a great patient. During one of his dental visits, I asked him, how would you like to have Bible studies with me? He said, I need Bible studies because I'm beginning to resent God. During one of our Bible studies, he told me that on a scale of 1 to 10, the pain in his leg is a 12. But it's not so much the pain in his leg that bothers him as much as the void in his life the emptiness life that he could not fill. I could relate because when I was in the world, I experienced that void in my life, and only Jesus could fill it. I'm no cardiothoracic surgeon, but even the best surgeon in the world cannot fill that void in his heart. But you and I know of someone who alone can fill that void in Trayson's heart, someone who can give him a new heart. After Trey went to church with me on Sabbath for his very first time last fall, that evening he told me that he was experiencing peace in his life that he has not felt in a long time. In February, I had the privilege and honor of baptizing Trey. Trey still struggles with chronic pain, but now he has peace and joy in his life because he has Jesus. I wasn't always earnest and ardent about soul winning. Many years ago, I invited a young man to come to my home. I wanted to talk about some of the issues we were having in our local church. I basically had a lot of complaining to do, and I wanted a sounding board, and I wanted someone to affirm my complaining. As we began, the young man said to me, are you giving any Bible studies? It was an awkward moment for me as I was being gently rebuked and I knew exactly the point that he was making. In essence, what he was saying is, unless you're rowing the boat, you got no business rocking the boat. <laughs> this conversation left a lasting impression on me that I need to be about the business of soul winning. Do I want to be a part of the solution or part of the problem stirring the proverbial pot? Today, our church has no shortage of people who are rocking the boat. Our church is plagued with divisive issues and you know what they are. Paul admonishes us, let there be no divisions among you. What is even worse than the divisive issues in our church is the way that church members are treating others with contempt and scorn towards those who hold opposing positions or views. We see church members reviling others. To revile is to criticize in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6.10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. In 1948, the Palomar Observatory in San Diego was being dedicated. The 200-inch Hale Telescope was the largest telescope in, of, in the world at that time. In light of the expanse of the cosmos, of billions of billions of galaxies, 
Within each, there are billions and billions of stars. I want to share with you just a snippet from the dedication speech. I want you to listen carefully to the simple but profound juxtaposition being underscored in this speech. In the face of these supreme mysteries and against this majestic background of space and time, the petty squabbling of nations on this small planet is not only irrelevant, but contemptible. Adrift in a cosmos whose shores he cannot even imagine, man spends his energies in fighting with his fellow man over issues which a single look through this telescope would show to be utterly inconsequential. I cannot help but apply a spiritual perspective to the sentiment. Here's my revision. In the face of eternal realities and against the majestic context of souls that were redeemed at an infinite price, at an infinite risk, the petty squabbling of church members on this small planet is not only irrelevant, but contemptible. Adrift in a cosmos whose shores we cannot even imagine, man spends his energies in fighting with his fellow church members over issues which a single look through the lens of the plan of redemption for man would show to be utterly inconsequential. I want us to be reminded that as a worldwide church, there's much more that unites us than divides us. And what unites us is much more important than what divides us. Testimonies for the church gives us a solution. If they would work to win souls to Christ, they will forget self and the desire to save souls. They will see so much work to do, so many fellow beings to help, that they will have no time to look for faults in others. They will have no time to work on the negative side. The world and our church has problems. I believe that soul winning is the only solution for both the world and for our church. There are no other solutions. There is no leader, strategy, or policy that can solve the problems we have because at its core, it's a sin problem. I believe that if everyone was engaged in soul winning, most all of the problems in our church would disappear. I was out running with my buddy who was a missionary from the 1040 window. I asked him about what position the missionaries held on a certain controversial issue in our church. He chuckled and laughed because the missionaries don't care. They're too busy winning souls. 16 months ago, I was on the phone with my buddy Ernest Palm. During our conversation, he told me that he had 20 Bible study contacts. I had one patient I was studying the Bible with. I was inspired, but I was also rebuked. I've got one life to live, one life to give. How am I living my life? I knelt down and prayed. And I asked God if he would give me 20 Bible studies contacts. Within five months, God had given me over 20 Bible study contacts. I've never been busier in my life, but never happier, and there's nothing else I love to talk about more. Ricky is an automotive mechanic for Toyota. Ricky had a disdain for one of his coworkers, Brad, who's a Seventh-day Adventist, because Brad is like a proverbial goody two-shoes. Someone could be rude and unprofessional, and Brad always had the positive attitude. This seemed fake and self-righteous to Ricky. He would voice to Brad, stop being fake, be real. This ain't who you is. Stop acting like you're okay with this. Ricky would try to rib him and try to push his buttons to get him to react, but Brad never faltered. Over time, Ricky observed Brad's consistency. What was initially disdain and annoyance slowly turned into admiration and respect. Ricky eventually decided that he wanted what Brad had. He told me, I want what this guy has, and whatever he's a part of, I want to be a part of it. So he asked me for Bible studies. As I gave Ricky Bible studies, his 15-year-old son began to study with us. I had the privilege of baptizing Ricky this last March, but it gets even better. After his baptism, his wife wanted Bible studies. At our first Bible study, I asked her why she wanted Bible studies. She told me it was because of the changes she had seen in her husband's life. Isn't this the essence and the power of the gospel? The gospel is all about change. As Ricky saw Brad's Christian, consistent example, it moved him to want what Brad had. And as Ricky's wife saw the changes in her husband, she now wanted what he had. I foresaw one major obstacle. Their son Iverson had been boxing since he was two years old. When you're 15, that's almost practically your entire life. He was an amazing boxer. This was a big part of their lives. Boxing matches are usually held on Sabbath, and destroying your opponent in the ring is a little antithetical to the three angels' message. <laughs> At our second Bible study with the family, they shared that Iverson had quit boxing. I was in awe. His dad mentioned to me about the Sabbath conflict. His dad also told me that Bible studies was his son's newfound interest. Is that amazing or what? Teenager would rather learn about the Bible? I could only praise God. I've done a lot of exciting things in my life, and I will tell you that there is nothing that compares to leading someone to Jesus and then taking them all the way to baptism. 
Sister White tells us there is no greater bliss on this side of heaven than in winning souls to Christ, and I can attest to the veracity of this quote. My current staff are all studying the Bible with me. I have a special place in my heart for my Mennonite patients. They are such conscientious Christians. Last December, one of my Mennonite patients, he asked me, do you have a local church you attend? I was hemming and hawing, trying to figure out how to answer this question, and he said, I know you're an Adventist. <laughs> I have an interest in the Sabbath. He had been watching this Messianic Jew, Zev Porat, on YouTube. And, he wanted to study, and I had to ask him, do you want to study the Bible with me? You can imagine my joy when we got to the Sabbath topic. He says to me, I think you're right about the Sabbath. And you can imagine how thrilled I was when he brought his wife and two of his children to church on Sabbath. Just four days ago, he asked me if it would be okay if he could bring a Mennonite friend to our Bible studies. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I live for this. I just hope their bishop doesn't find out about this too soon. I received a phone call from an unknown number. The voice on the other end said, you gave me this book with your phone number in it. It was a great controversy that I had given to my patient. She said, our family has been studying the Bible to try and understand Bible prophecy, and we are struggling. Would you give us Bible studies? Could you imagine trying to understand Bible, study, Bible prophecy on your own? She showed up with four of her family members. The pen of inspiration tells us that there are those in the world who are reading the scriptures but who cannot understand their import. The men and women who have a knowledge of God are needed to explain the word to these souls. You and I have been blessed with marvelous light. What a privilege it is for us to help those in darkness to understand truth. I'm finding that if we make ourselves available, God will allow us to cross paths with those who are searching for truth. One of my patients, Jordan, was looking and searching for truth. Do you know where young people go to find truth? They go to YouTube. And it's a jungle out there. I had asked his grandfather if he wanted Bible studies, and while he didn't accept, I'm so glad he referred his grandson, because his grandson accepted. And his grandson, Jordan, and his wife, Maria, they were soaking it all in. Just six weeks ago, I got to baptize both of them. I had shared, in my life, I've never seen such an interest among people for Bible studies. I believe it is because of the times that we are living in. People are searching for answers. And I also believe that the Holy Spirit is being poured out. I shared a short version of my testimony at a local ASI event. A friend of mine, Rebecca, heard me share. She went home and prayed and asked if God would give her people to study the Bible with. The first four people she asked all said yes. She was so excited as she was telling me about it over the phone. I told her on the phone that at that time, it seemed that for every four of the people that I ask, I get one Bible study. Rebecca exclaimed, I'm at 100% because everybody I asked said yes. <laughs> I told her, you're doing better than me. I was so happy for her. Just as I had prayed and Rebecca had prayed for Bible study contacts, I hope that many of you would consider praying and asking God to give you a Bible study contact, as I know that this is a prayer God delights to answer. I know it can be intimidating to ask someone if they want Bible studies. Don't ask people until you've won their confidence first. But if you've won their confidence, Ask them. You'd be surprised at how many people just need an invitation. This was a text from Tracy, my 24-year-old patient who was the basketball star in high school. Hey, I just want to let you know how thankful I am for you. I said yes to a Bible study and it changed my life. Thank you. What if I hadn't asked him if he wanted Bible studies? I would have missed the opportunity to make a difference in his life. I love the theme of this conference, Revived to Witness, Transformed, United, Sent, Sent. Do you need revival in your life? Are you struggling spiritually? I'm going to tell you why I believe people struggle spiritually. This is from my own personal experience as well as my observation of others. I used to work with the team and organize Bible conferences. People would come to our events and they would be on a spiritual high when they left. I myself, as I was leaving, I said, you know what, I'm going to spend more time in the Word of God. I'm going to spend more time in prayer. And what happened after a week or two? They'd be back on a spiritual low. And some of these people would just come back to our camp after camp. You know why? Because they wanted to experience the spiritual high. We know from the holy place and sanctuary that the key to a healthy spiritual life is threefold. The table of showbread represents the word of God. The altar of incense represents prayer. And the seven branch candlestick represents our witness. To have a healthy spiritual life, it requires all three. I truly believe it's because most of us are reading our Bibles, we listen to sermons, we have our devotional time. We pray, we go to prayer meetings, but we are not sharing. 
If you want to be a successful marathon runner, it requires three things. You need to train, you need rest and recovery for your body, and you need nutrition and hydration. You can train all you want seven days a week, no rest and recovery, you will fail to be a great marathon runner. You can train all you want and eat healthy. You got to do all three to be a successful marathon runner. I have observed a common denominator amongst the happiest on fire Christians. They are always sharing their faith. When I am sharing Jesus with others, I become a channel for God's love to flow through me. And I walk away being inspired and encouraged by the things that I was sharing to encourage somebody else. And I walk away with fresh revelations of God's love for me in my life. There's only one miracle that is mentioned in all four of the Gospels aside from the resurrection. It's the feeding of the 5,000. In this miracle, Jesus says to his disciples, give them something to eat. Give them food to eat. What does food represent in the Bible? The word of God, right? The lamp. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. The sword. Manna. Milk. The sower went to sow seeds. The seed. These things all represent the word of God. Jesus says, give them something to eat something to eat. And what is their reply? We have but five loaves and two fish. They're saying, we don't have enough to share. We say this all the time. I don't know how to give a Bible study. I don't have time. We don't have the resources. And what does Jesus say? Just give me what you got. And he takes it. He blesses it. He prays over it. This story underscores the spiritual lesson that you and I are the disciples. We are to come to Jesus each morning. He will give you food to share. And we go and we share it with the multitude. We come back to Jesus, he'll give us more. It never runs out and it never gets old. Who do you think was having the most fun? I'm confident it was the disciples who were having the most fun. In Desire of Ages, regarding this story, we are told we must receive to impart. Only as we impart can we receive more. As we continue imparting, we continue to receive. And the more we impart, the more we shall receive. Sharing is critical to revival. We are told in evangelism, light is only given to those who will reflect that light upon others. There is nothing like giving a Bible study and God brings to my mind just at the right moment the text, an illustration, or a story that perfectly is adapted for the situation to know that God is speaking through me and to feel his love and power in a most palpable and tangible way. Do you struggle with fear, anxiety, and stress? The thing that used to stress me out the most were things related to my office. If I had an issue with my patient, that would stress me out. Office problems don't stress me out anymore as I've got more important things that I'm dealing with. People say 40 is over the hill. It's not true. It's 45. (laughs) Everything was grand until I turned 45. I'm currently 48. My hair started to recede. I've got reading, reading glasses everywhere. I've never had to wear glasses. Now I cannot see. I cannot read without glasses. Just recently, last summer, I had to have laser therapy on my gums, and I'm a dentist. My receding hair bothered me a lot. It doesn't bother me anymore. Do you know why? Because now my hair is thinning on top. (laughs) That's a way bigger problem. (laughs) I never knew what it meant, volume. Now I understand creating volume. I totally understand now. (laughs) But you get the point that I'm making. When you're dealing with more important things, other things become inconsequential. In soul winning, we are dealing with the most important matters, things of eternal consequences, the destiny of men and women. Everything else becomes trivial and inconsequential. This summer, I've got a lot of speaking engagements, and so I've been praying that God would give me a testimony to share. And you know what God sends me? About two and a half weeks ago, I got a patient who comes in, and he threatens me with a lawsuit. I asked God for a testimony, and I got a patient who threatened me with a lawsuit. Five years ago, I would have been losing sleep. Do you know how much sleep I've lost over this? Not one bit. I don't even have time to even worry about it. And all I can do is praise God. And I'm like, God, you did give me a testimony. I want to have the faith of Daniel. I want to get through life with confidence and edge and not have to worry about these things that used to stress me out. Our ministry, FI Challenge, was holding one of our events at Zion National Park. We had a young man, he's sitting right up here, Xu Vang, coming. And Xu Vang has muscular dystrophy. He was diagnosed at 15. He was coming, he was 30 years old. She was in a very dark place. He was discouraged and depressed. She was married and had a little girl, but his wife left him a number of years ago because he was no longer the man that she had married. His sister asked if there were any hikes that we could take him on on a wheelchair, and when I looked it up, there were some paved trails you could take somebody in a wheelchair on. But you know what? I said to our team, let's take him on a real hike. So I said, let's take him to the top of Angel's Landing. For some of you who don't know what Angel's Landing is, it's 
probably one of the top 10 most popular hikes in the world. But it's also considered one of the top 10 most dangerous hikes in the world. We assembled a team of 32 people, and we wheeled them in his wheelchair as far as we could go. And when we could no longer take him up on his wheelchair, at that point, we took turns. We had a special carry, and we threw him on our back, and we started carrying up to the top of Angel's Landing. Um, I want to highlight one thing, and you can see, because there's literally, in certain areas, there's just sheer cliffs on the sides. And uh, next slide, please. I want to just point this out. Right here on the bottom right corner, that's actually Ryan Booth. He's one of the um, board members of ASI. Just in case anyone questions the wisdom of our adventure, I want to somehow implicate ASI leadership with this. That's actually Ryan right here. <laughs> Ryan actually carried shoot through some of the most difficult and most hardest, most difficult areas. And when we got to the top, it was a very moving experience for us, but it was life-changing for Shu. Shu's life turned around. He is now a part of our team, and now he is using God's blessings to be a blessing to other people. Amen. We weren't expecting this, but it made the news. It made Inside Edition. They did a feature on this. And so it was a really exciting thing. But here's why I'm telling you this story. There are people on our team who have a legitimate fear of heights. However, not one person that I know of on our team complained or was crippled by their fear of heights. Why do you suppose that is? Everyone was focused on getting Shu to the top, and they forgot about their problems. Do you struggle with fear and worry? Focus on getting others to heaven. It's the best way to forget about your own problems. It is a key to true happiness. As we come to, as we near the end, I want us to look at two characters in the Bible that I'm hoping will put all this into perspective, Noah and Lot. These two men have many things in common. Jesus mentions both of these men in Luke 17 by name, by virtue of the fact that Jesus mentions them by name. I think they deserve our careful consideration. Think about the things they have in common. Both were men. Both were fathers. Both were husbands. Both lived through judgment time. Both are mentioned in the book of Genesis. They both lived among a time of great sin. Both tried to save other people. They both got drunk. Both experienced a close of probation. When the doors of the ark closed, probation had closed for the antediluvians. In Genesis 19, the angels pulled light in and shut the door. While they have many things in common, I want to shift our attention to the variances between these two. For Noah, it was destruction by water. For Lot, it was destruction by fire. For Noah, it was a worldwide destruction. For Lot, it was localized. Sodom and Gomorrah and a few other cities. Noah knew for 120 years that Judgment Day was coming. Lot only knew for about 12 hours. From dusk to dawn, Noah understood his mission in life and everything that he did was colored by his mission. Lot was for, focused on procuring himself a comfortable life in the here and now. Lot was a good man, but he wasn't living out his God-given mission. Lot was busy keeping up with the Joneses. Noah was busy keeping up with Jesus, the mission that Jesus had given him to do. Noah was preaching a present truth message about a coming judgment. Lot was not preaching a present truth message. Noah was prepared for the judgment. Lot was caught by total surprise by the coming judgment. Noah and Lot represent two classes of people who will be in heaven. There will be people in heaven like Noah because he understood his mission in life. He went for broke. He went all in. He left nothing on the table. As a result, his entire family was saved. There will be people in heaven like Lot. And while they are saved into God's kingdom, at what cost? He lost his wife. his other daughters and sons-in-law, and only two of his daughters were saved. Patriarchs and Prophets tells us about Noah that all that he possessed, he invested in the ark. What is the net result? When judgment had come and gone, Noah had retained his entire investment. He lost nothing. It's called laying up your treasures in heaven. Conversely, Lot lost everything he owned except the shirt on his back. Noah had prepared for 120 years. As Judgment Day approached, Noah and his family were fully prepared, and they could face the time of trouble with confidence and edge. How would you like to have that kind of peace of mind and freedom as our world is unraveling? Lot was completely blindsided. We are told Lot was paralyzed by the great calamity and stupefied with grief. Do you know what it means to be stupefied? It means, to, it means unable to think or feel properly. He is in sheer panic as he's trying to convince his other children to flee the coming destruction. We already know what our mission in life is. We are living in judgment hour. We have a present truth message to preach 
the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation of Jesus' soon return, do we want to be like Noah or Lot? As we juxtapose these two characters and examine their lives from the perspective of the end of their lives, the answer is so obvious, isn't it? Mother Teresa summarized it so succinctly. God has called us not to be successful, but to be faithful. Being in ministry from time to time, I'll have a mother come to me in near tears as her heart is breaking for her wayward son or daughter. There may be some of you in the audience who can relate. As I, my wife and I, we have two teenage daughters, 17 and 15, and while we've raised them to the best of our ability to love Jesus, we don't know if they'll always stay in the fold. Listen carefully to one of my favorite quotes from patriarchs and prophets that I'd like to share with these mothers whose heart is broken for their wayward child. Speaking of Noah, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 98, it says, as a reward for his faithfulness and integrity, God saved all the members of his family with him. I love this last part. What encouragement to parental fidelity. By virtue of the last sentence that encourages us to parental fidelity, this tells me that you and I may also be privy to special blessings and rewards if we are faithful to God. We know that God cannot save someone who does not want to be saved, but we also know that God can bestow special blessings upon his children. So let's be faithful like Noah was and leave it to God to reward us as he sees fit. When you get to heaven, what is the first thing that you are going to want to do? Are you going to want to check out your heavenly bank account and see how much treasure you have stored up in heaven? Are you going to want to go check out your swanky new mansion and see what God has in store for you? Are you going to want to go play with the lions? There are only two things that you're going to want to do when you get to heaven. You're going to want to meet Jesus. And you're going to want to see your loved ones, your family, your friends, and those you have won into his kingdom. Those are the only two things that will matter. If those are the only two things that matter when we get to heaven, maybe they're the only two things that should matter to us now. I don't know if we will have regret when we're in heaven because regret means to have deep sorrow and we're told we will not have sorrow in heaven. But if there are any regrets, the universal regret will be that we didn't do more while we could to win people into God's kingdom. You and I, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to win souls for God's kingdom. In heaven, we will never have this opportunity ever again. What if we go all in, go for broke, leave nothing on the table, and win as many souls as we can for God's kingdom. We have one life to live, one life to give. How do you want to live your life? As C.T. Studd put it best, only one life till soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Calvin, thank you. Thank you so much for your message, Calvin. But you know, while I'm listening to you, I can't help but to wonder, what if I'm not as charismatic as you? What if I'm not as outgoing as you? What hope do I have of sharing my faith with others? How can I overcome my fear of talking to people about my faith? You know, I have a message for people who are introverts because my wife is an introvert and my two daughters are introverts. And the thing is, the first thing that I love to encourage people is just to share GLOW. You can leave GLOW in a public restroom. There are, there's someone who just recently requested Bible studies because they found a GLOW in a restroom. So begin with the simple little things like that. I claim the promise that God says, if you're faithful in the little things, he will make you ruler over much. But you know what? When you're excited about something, is it hard for you to talk about your vacation? How about the finals, the championships? How about your new car, your new house? It's easy to talk about that. When you love Jesus, it comes naturally. And I want to remind everyone, I'm just one beggar sharing with other beggars where to find food. I know it's intimidating for people. People ask me often, how do you give Bible studies? I used to say, if you can read, you can give a Bible study, but I don't say that anymore. You know why? I have some friends, all they do is they drop a Bible study guide at someone's house. Come back next week, pick it up, and drop another one off. If you don't know how to read, you can still give a Bible study. If you know how to read, it's as simple as you can read the question and answer, read the question and answer. I have a friend, she did that with four people, went all the way through all the Amazing Facts study guides, and four people got baptized. Because we're told the secret of success is the union of divine power and human effort. She doesn't say human elocution or human eloquence or human brilliance. I'm so thankful because as you saw when I first came out here, I said, I'm not going to say good evening, GYC, and that's exactly what I said. (laughs) 
And so I'm not eloquent, as you can see. That's why I've got notes. There are speakers who are much more eloquent than I am. They don't need notes. But say, so you know what I do? I just lean on Jesus, and in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. But Calvin, what do you, how do you get your Bible studies? I mean, dropping off a study is great to someone who's expecting it, but how do you even get to the point where someone says, yes, drop off Bible studies for question. me? In the morning, start your day with asking God to give you divine appointments. And then when you head out the door, throw some glow tracks in your pocket. Because when you do that, you're starting your day off with a mindset for evangelism. It says Jesus, in every person that he saw, he saw a soul to be saved. If you take on that mindset, you will look at people differently. You'll look at your coworkers differently. You'll look at your patients differently. And you're looking for opportunities because the Holy Spirit will open those doors at just the right time. And so start with the mindset for evangelism. And like I mentioned earlier, I want to highly emphasize, I don't just pull someone's wisdom teeth and be like, you want Bible studies? <laughs> A lot of times they're excited, they're happy, or I've won their confidence, and then that's time. Another thing is look for people who are hurting as they're more inclined and open to studying the Bible. And you know what? I don't like, re I don't like being rejected. I'm like everyone else. But you know, when you get excited, excitement is contagious. And when they see that you're passionate about it, worst thing they can say is, no, thank you. I'll just tell you what I do, basically, with my patients. When they're excited, they're happy, or I got to give them something, I hand them a great controversy, I write my phone number in here, I hand it to them, I just tell you, this is one of my favorite books that I love giving out to patients. And you know, the reason why I hand it out is because the world's a little crazy. You know what they do? They usually nod invariably and smile. I will say, you know, the reason why I believe in the Bible is because of Bible prophecy. It's been accurate 100% of the time. If you're ever interested, let me know, and I'd love to study the Bible with you. It's that simple. I'm not pressuring them. I'm not asking for an answer. They go home. They got my number. And just like that patient called me, but she didn't come back by herself, right? She brought four family members with me, with her. And so, you know, if you're excited about something, it's easy, to, it's easy to talk about it. But I do understand. At first, it can be daunting. And for me, it's just gotten easy because I do it regularly. But pray and ask God to give you those opportunities. You know, in the midst of passing out literature, in the midst of asking people if they're interested in Bible studies or sharing your faith, has anyone ever gotten offended at you or upset with you or felt like it was inappropriate? Absolutely. I've only had, I've only had one person one time. In our office, we value our reviews online. The majority of our patients come because of our reviews online. I share this to give God the glory. On, on, on Yelp, our office is listed as number one out of the top 10 list. On Google, we're in the most organic spot. I give God the praise and glory for that. Now, that makes sense, right? Wouldn't God want to bless our office because we're sharing light? I had a lady, and I was doing a COVID survey that I used to use to give out the great controversy. She was so offended. She left the book at the front. She went home, called the Department of Health on me, and left a scathing, scathing Yelp review. And I know most of you guys will probably go on there and look at it. <laughs> at first, when I looked at that review, my heart sort of kind of sank. Because she made me look like I was crazy, like I held her hostage. All I did was a simple survey. She made me look like I was crazy. But I prayed. And then I got up, and my fears just dissipated. In a weird way, it's actually my favorite review. Do you know why? I'll be honest with you. I've never been persecuted in my life. It's the first time I've actually been persecuted for Jesus. <laughs> Another thing is, do you think God could, if God can make a donkey talk, do you think God could hide someone's eyes so they don't even see the reviews? You know what's interesting? That month, my office manager told me, we averaged 50 new patients a month. She told me that month, we had 70 new patients. To me, it was like God telling me, don't even worry. It was just another faith-building experience. So that's one time I had someone offended. Um, you know, in the prayer box, once in a while, someone will write something that's a little bit crass. But in general, it's well-received. So what resources then do you use, Calvin, when someone wants a Bible study? Do you come up with material yourself? Is there something that you recommend? What would you do? On Facebook, we have a group called Evangel Living. It's two words combined, intentional and deliberate life of evangelism. I encourage you to join if you're on Facebook. And we just share tips and resources. We put a bunch of videos of speakers sharing about how to witness, how to give your first Bible study, how to uh, witness to Muslims, how to witness to different audiences. And we put them all on YouTube under Evangel Living. And so you can join and you have access to all those. If you personally message me, I'll be glad to share any resources because I can only do so many Bible studies in a week. I'm very busy. And so if I can encourage and inspire other people to give Bible studies, that's the best use of my time. And so I'm more than happy. I will personally share with you resources. But my favorite is Amazing Fact Study Guides. 
I do my study, Bible studies on a computer. I don't do it with a Bible next to the patient. It's too easy on a computer screen. They can watch your screen. You can highlight things. You can pull up images, text. You forget something, few words, click. You got the text right there. You can put up images of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so it's just too easy to do Bible studies like that. And the blessing of COVID is Zoom. Most of us now know how to use Zoom. Now you can share screen. And I can do Bible studies with somebody that's in Europe. And so um, no shortage of resources. But it's like anything else. The first time might be intimidating, but after you start doing it, I cannot tell you how satisfying it is to give a Bible study. Thank you so much, Calvin, for sharing all that wisdom and advice that you've accumulated. And now, could you close us with a word of prayer as we end this evening? If you bow your heads with me, dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are willing to risk failure and eternal loss to come and save and redeem us. We want to thank you so much, Lord. You're so good to us. We want to ask that you would help us to live faithfully. We want to be revived to witness, transformed, united, and sent. Help us to be faithful so that Jesus can receive the full reward for his suffering and his sacrifice. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.
the thing.